Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, they uh, that you have been enjoying the program thus far. Uh, my name is Bilal Bakay, and we are going to be shortly getting started uh, with the next uh, session, inshallah. Uh, so we have a great lineup of speakers, uh, alhamdulillah, as, as well. Um, I just wanted to make some quick announcements. Uh, one of the main goals for this conference, inshallah, is to uh, inspire you guys to join uh, ICNA uh, um, IGNA and uh, with, in, in your local communities. Uh, please, you know, look online, look to volunteer. You can go on www.icna.org slash volunteer. Or um, you can also participate by donating, as you can see uh, below, that we are in deep uh, need uh, for your financial contribution. Uh, typically, you know, the convention would be a great spo uh, uh, location where we would be able to do this. But unfortunately, due to COVID, um, the pandemic has uh, caused uh, a lot of our cash flow to be uh, to resend as well. So please uh, make sure, uh, if you are able to, to go on www.icna.org. Uh, and click donate. Um, so with that, inshallah, we'll start with the next speaker. Uh, Imam Khalid Griggs is going to be joining us. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, the Prophet's effort to, e to eradicate racism. Uh, Imam Khalid is a board uh, chair of ICNA uh, Council for Social Justice. Uh, he's also an Imam Community Mosque in Winston-Salem uh, and board of directors uh, at Institute uh, for Dismantling Racism every town for gun safety faith advisory council imam khalid assalamualaikum bismillahirrahmanirrahim brothers and sisters the discussion about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu efforts to dismantle or eradicate racism is a very timely discussion because throughout the world, here in the United States and all over the world, we have right-wing right populist radical leaders who are fueling the division between the races and ethnicities we need only to look at some of the greatest disasters, humanitarian disasters that are happening in the world, the Rohingya people from Burma, uh, the Uyghurs in China, and the list goes on and on. And as a result of racism, as a result of this kind of ethnic uh, hatred, we've come to the situation that we have in the world today. And I'd just like to start with just a brief workable definition for anyone who may not understand what racism actually is. And for the purpose of this discussion, I'll just say that the racism is the belief that different races possess distinct and, and unique characteristics, abilities, or qualities, especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another. I would go as far to say that as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us in the Quran, that the original sin, starting with Iblis, starting with the shaitan, was that of racism. It was out of his arrogance, thinking that his formation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a fireless, a smokeless fire was superior to Adam, who was created from dirt, created from the mud. And so this, this scourge of humanity, of racism and ethnic hatred is something that started even before human beings were assigned for a period to live here on earth. At the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the formation, the social formation in the Meccan society was that of tribalism, that tribalism dominated uh, the social landscape uh, in Mecca and throughout the Arabian Peninsula. And this tribalism was uh, had shared elements of the kind of racist structures that we have today, but not exactly. 
And uh, as I go further into the discussion, uh, I will elucidate a little more about what I mean uh, by it not being exactly like that, like it is today. Asabiyah, uh, had a definition for it, was given by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in ex answering a question about uh, from one of the Sahaba, one of the companions who asked, Do, uh, you know, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I love my people meaning his tribe. And is this asabiya? Is this what you have been talking against? Is this a kind of form of nationalism? Is it a, an idea, an expression that is uh, condemned by you and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's response was no. Loving your people is not alone. It's not asabiya. It's when you're upholding your people and injustice and oppression and doom. You're helping someone do what's wrong. This is asabiya. You're doing it because you are the same tribe, you're the same ethnicity, you are the same race. Then this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the behavior, this is the attitude that was condemned by Allah and condemned by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This concept of asabiya was one that was so prevalent at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that it was just like it was just natural. This is the way things are to be. And we find that after the Hijra, the migration of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the believers from Mecca to Yathrib, soon to become the city of Medina, the city of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that asabiya had to take a back seat in this Muslim state, in this Muslim society under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because Asabiyah was bringing people together around clannish beliefs. It was bringing people together not on what's right, what was pleasing to our Lord, but bringing them together around their tribal, for the most part, uh, identities. And so the concept of Ummah, was first introduced in the city-state of Medina on a practical level. And this concept of Ummah, as a, by, demonstrated by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and revealed uh, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, was this concept of coming together, not around our unique ethnic or racial qualities, but coming together around a commitment to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this concept of ummah was something that was very unique and almost foreign to those who were living in Mecca and the Arabian Peninsula. But this is the foundation upon which the Prophet Muhammad sallam, began his quest to eradicate racism and racist attitudes amongst the Muslims and to spread with these attitudes and these practices and these behaviors with the non-Muslim community as well. So the bedrock of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, starting this process of eradicating racism was through the concept of Ummah, that there is no human being that is superior to another simply on the basis of their birth, their accident of birth, but it takes a conscious decision and conscious behavior in order to find superiority in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but amongst human beings, no human being was created inferior or superior to one another. In this concept of ummah, we find that this first Islamic jamaat under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu this first jamaat of committed Muslims to the ideals of Islam, to the Quran, and to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that this first jamaat contained more than just Arabs. And these non-Arabs, 
And oftentimes their names are lost to the history. Their stories have been lost on the pages throughout the pages of history. But there were many non-Arabs that helped to fortify this concept of Ummah because we had persons and personalities like Bilal ibn Rabbah, who was the first Mu'adhan. He was the Mu'adhan of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and acted as a treasurer of the Baytul Mal, the treasurer of the Islamic State. Um Ayman, the Abyssinian woman that was in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the time of his birth, he only knew Um Ayman to the degree that he said that this African woman, this Abyssinian woman, is my mother after my mother, Osama ibn Zaid, and Zaid himself that these are individuals that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demonstrated throughout his life, his love for these non-Arab people because of their love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and love of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They had Salman El Farsi, Salman the Persian, Chuaib El Rumi, the Roman, that the Jamaat, that the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while being a majority Arab Jamaat, a majority Arab Ummah at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, that this was not an exclusive Ummah. And we find that through the sayings and the practices of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, that this equalitarian, this idea that no one is superior to another based on their birth and that it was it is despicable to think that one is superior to another simply because of what could be called an accident of birth. I'd like to just share a quick hadith that's narrated by Abu Malik al-Ashari. And he said that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that there are four affairs from al-Jahiliyyah, from the period of ignorance, the pre-Islamic days within my ummah that will not be abandoned. Boasting about noble descent, reviling the lineage of others, seeking rain through the stars and wailing over the dead. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in this hadith that's contained, and if my memory serves correctly, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying to this Ummah that, that boasting about having a noble descent and reviling the lineage of others is one of the things that everybody in this Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not be able to abandon. One good example from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of uh, an individual a very illustrious Sahaba, Abu Dha al Ghafari, that Abu Dha, and I don't have time to get into his history, but he was one of the foremost companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he got into a disagreement and an argument, and you're familiar with this story from the Hadith, that this Abu Dha, in his argument with Bilal ibn Rabbah, the black Abyssinian, Said to Abu, I uh, said to Bilal ibn Rabbah, Oh, you son of a black woman. This was not a kind of epithet that, that was praising Bilal or his lineage. It was an attempt on the part of Abu Dal to put Bilal down because his mother was an Abyssinian, was a black woman. That this was the kind of residue of Jahiliya that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that this is one thing that my ummah, not all of us will completely abandon. We know the rest of the story that when Bilal told the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the encounter that he had had with Abu Dha, Abu Dha was remorseful. He even put his face down on the ground and told Bilal, put your foot on my neck or on my face because I'm so wrong. Forgive me, Bilal. So this, this attitude, even amongst the Muslims, as demonstrated during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu by Abu Dha, that this is something that is very difficult to weave out 
to expel from our character, to expel from our hearts and with a Sahabi like Abu Dhar living at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu around would still demonstrate this kind of attitude with Bilal. Let me share uh, the essence of another quick a brief hadith where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as related by Ibn Umar has said that, O oh people, indeed Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has removed from you the arrogance of Jahaliyyah. This was said on the day of the conquest of Mecca. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu went on to say, and it's glorification of your forefathers. So the people are two types of men, righteous and devout person who is noble to Allah and a wretched sinner who is insignificant to Allah and the people are the children of Adam and Adam was created from dust. Brothers and sisters, the practice of Islam itself, the basic ibadah of every Muslim from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the way up to Qiyamah is Salah. The emphasis in Salah as we make the prayer, as we collectively pray the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed us was to come together and have be shoulder to shoulder regardless of who that person is on either side of you, to worship with whoever is in that salah line with no malice, with no harm to that person in your heart, in your mind, that the worship itself brings us together in a way that would help us relieve ourselves of any feelings of superiority, any feeling of because of my noble birth, that I have a birthright to be in a higher position in Salah, to have this person behind me, far behind me, and not sandwiched in between these people who on a social scale do not equal uh, what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. Brothers and sisters, when we understand the anti-racist attitude and behavior of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu we have to understand that this was not an attitude that was locked in time. But this is an attitude for everyone who claims belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that we are divinely mandated and obligated to have, take a position against these kinds of arrogant, these kinds of racist and, and ethnic hatred, the, these attitudes that so prevail across the world today. There has not been a time, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, in my decades of living on this earth, or my reading of history about the United States, that particularly here in the United States, there has not been a time where this country has been so racially and ethnically divided as it is now since the time of the Civil War back in the 1860s, starting in 1861. There has not been a time when this nation has been so polarized around race. So for me and for others, this means that now, this is not a, just a historical discussion where we're talking about what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu do? Just a few instances of what did he do to try to eradicate in the society that this has to be used as a blueprint, as a guide, as a map to guide us as Muslims living in this world and living in the societies in which we live as to how we must take a stand and provide leadership to the countries, the nations in which we live. 
as I mentioned earlier, it's not just enough for us to say that I am not a racist personally. I don't, don't dislike anybody. I have Pakistani, I have Chinese, I have African American, I have white friends who are Muslim. I don't dislike anyone. It's not enough for us to individually take a stand and believe that we are not racist. What is demanded of us as part of this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is to be those standard bearers as Allah commands us to be in the Quran for justice. For us to be standard bearers in the society in which we live, we have to be, we have to address the sickness, the illness that has brought the world to the brink, literally almost, of humanitarian destruction because of these attitudes that pervade even amongst uh, the Muslims, many Muslims, that because of their land of birth, because of their race, their ethnicity, that they are superior to other human beings. So no, you and I, like the Prophet Muhammad must challenge expressions, even in our own families. If we are hearing attitudes expressed about another group of people in a derogatory manner that could easily and definitely be qualified as being a racist uh, depiction of a person, of people who are not from the same tribe or family that you're from, we have to challenge that. We have to not just sit and listen, whether it's our mother and our father, whether it's family members, whether this person is rich, whether this person is poor, we must take a stand like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu took a stand against racism and ethnic hatred and ethnic uh, feelings of superiority, that this is part of the sunnah, that as Muslims living in the times in which we live, that we must follow. I want to just close uh, on this particular note. And that is that you and I, if we don't understand anything about the life of one of the illustrious martyrs of Islam here on American soul, and I'm talking about El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, Malcolm X then we should explore his life, particularly during those last 11 months when he was following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and abiding by, to the best of his ability, the guidance of the Quran. And one of the things that uh, Malcolm X, Malik El Shabazz, a very famous quotation from uh, Malcolm, after he, as he was performing the pilgrimage, after he had made the pilgrimage to Mecca, and this was done all the way back in April of 1964, just one month after his leaving the Nation of Islam, which for 12 years, he was the foremost uh, person in this country who was espousing racist ideas, characterizing white people as the devil, because this was the philosophy of the organization at that time. But Malcolm said and understood just in the short period that he had in life after embracing true Islam was that America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. Now keep in mind this was said in 1964. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white. But the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all together, irrespective 
of their colors. Malcolm was one of the foremost astute observers of American society, particularly as it related, as it relates to the uh, racial composition and interaction in this country. This is the attitude that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would want us to present in this society that this racism, this cancer, this tearing this nation apart, that you need to understand Islam. You need to understand Islam from the perspective of committed Muslims. And I'm saying this not denigrating or trying to put down anyone, but you cannot understand Islam by looking at the behavior or the action of the words of those who have a half-hearted commitment to this way of life. And so if you and I want to be raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the sadaqeen, if we want to be raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those who have his favor and not those who've sat in the society and have been concerned only about our own personal enrichment, our family enrichment, and we haven't been concerned about the obvious that has been in our face for all of the time that this nation has been the nation. That's what I'm working on. Jazakallah khair, uh, I'm getting a little bit of a feedback. Um, but yes, that was a great reminder. Um, and honestly, I think just to summarize in your own words, uh, what you uh, what you can kind of conclude with, it's not enough for us to just say that we're not racist. And I think that's the biggest mistake um, that we have been guilty of for the longest time. Uh, whereas, alhamdulillah, in the more, more recent events, it has awoken us and hopefully uh, awakens everybody to realize that we have to be the flag bearers if we are indeed um, calling ourselves the followers of the Prophet Wasallam. So, jazakallah khair um, yeah. for that and for that reminder, um, guys, uh, for sharing uh, gems with us and about the life of the Prophet I mean, this is just a small uh, step in the right direction of learning about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So hopefully uh, today you were motivated uh, by a, a speech, a lecture, a quote, a gem that will make your journey uh, into, to, to learn about the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life uh, and start that journey inshallah. Um, and with that I would also like to thank the organizers who put this together. Um, it's amazing that, uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, even within a pandemic, we are able to connect each other and convey the message uh, to the best of our ability. And uh, as mentioned throughout the program today, one of the main goals of this conference is to inspire attendees um, to, to, con to act, to get up and volunteer, uh, to do something uh, and, and inspired by the life of the Prophet Sallallahu whether it's uh, participating through um, ICNA or elsewhere within your local community, but at least become active. Um, and lastly, I would like to just request everyone that if you have not are, are not volunteering with ICNA, be sure to sign up. You can go to www.icna.org slash volunteer and you can sign up and become part of a local chapter. One of the greatest things about ICN is their grassroots effort. And so their local chapters, local units uh, that you can engage with, inshallah. And lastly, uh, if you are able to uh, donate uh, with if not your time, but financially make a monetary contribution, please do so by visiting www.icna.org slash donate. Jazakumullah khair.